Okay, welcome back to product quality development. What we're gonna be taking a look at here is defining quality, dimensions of product and service quality, uh, total quality management, and we're gonna look at that using the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award and taking a look at that. And then we're gonna take a look at sustainability and product development. So let's start out with what is quality, which is a pretty big issue. It's different for each and every person. Everyone sees quality different. It's a perception. But we take a look at the following implication. Satisfaction or quality depends upon evaluation of people outside the company. It's not you who is going to say, this is a quality level of my product. It's people outside your company who are going to tell you that. And all parts of the company play a role in seeing that the customer's needs and expectations are met. I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. Your wants, your needs mean nothing. It's the customer's wants and needs that we need to really take a look at to fit the quality level that they want. And customer satisfaction is long term, but it's also based on comparison. So they're going to compare your product to somebody else's product to see which one is better. Quality is dynamic and moving. It's a dynamic moving target. Yes today, maybe a no tomorrow. And if you take a look back upon yourself, think about your favorite restaurant as a five-year-old. When you were five years old, what was your favorite restaurant? McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, Hardee's, you know, who had the best toy in the kid's meal? What's your favorite restaurant today? Has it changed? I'm betting that for most of you it has. Quality means different things to different people. Different people believe different things about quality. Um, what I think is good, somebody else might not. It's sort of like our different tastes, that we're looking at those different tastes. So we're gonna be taking a look at how quality differs with different people also in here. Um, we want to start with the quality of conformance, the degree to which the output of an operation meets the producer's expectations. If you take a look, this is a cord on this picture. It is specifically for a certain type of outlet, and it's not a U.S. outlet. When we take a look at cords, uh, plugs, uh, things like that, we need them to conform. We expect them to be very similar. When you plug in, when you create an outlet in your wall, you want to be able to plug in uh, your computer, your, com your printer, a uh, curling iron, a uh, iron iron, um, a coffee pot, all of these different things. And the plug has to conform to do that. Um, the degree to which the output of an operation meets the producer's expectations. The producer is setting these expectations and making sure that they meet what the producer wants. Quality of design deals with customer's expectations. The degree to which the output of an operation meets the customer's expectations. There's, you know, lovely little uh, emojis there, the happy face, the sad face, uh, green into red. Where does this uh, put you? What, how uh, does it meet your expectations? Does it meet them greatly? Does it not meet them? Looking at that. There's eight aspects of a product. And I like to use a car for this. Um, right now, I, I have just started looking for a new car. Um, I have a Honda Accord, which is a 1998 Honda Accord with over almost 431,000 miles on my car. And I have this car because the reliability, one of the aspects, um, I'm able to get it serviced. It's, I, my mechanic knows my car since I've had my car. He's been working with me and being my mechanic. So 
I have the serviceability. It's easy to get to the mechanic and get the work done. It's reliable. 430,000 miles on a car is a lot of miles. Um, it does what I want it to do, the performance. It has the features. It has a moon roof. It has, you know, the radio works. Um, I put the key in the ignition and it starts. That's a really big one for me. Um, durability. It's almost 19 years old. That's pretty durable. Uh, conformance. It does what it's supposed to do. It does, um, it conforms to where uh, car lengths, car being able to fit into parking uh, spots, being able to fit into the garage. It's conforming into those expectations also. The aesthetic characteristics. Uh, when I got it, it was this teal, dark teal blue green color. I forget what the name of the actual color is, but it's a dark teal blue green and it's pretty. The inside is a dark gray. I like it. Um, the perceived quality. Honda has a very good perceived quality. It's an excellent car. It lasts. The durability, the serviceability, the, the reliability, all of those are in there with a perceived quality. Um, years ago, Ford tried to put the Nova into Mexico and sell the car in Mexico. The problem is Nova in Spanish means it does not go. So the perceived quality for the car was not there. The car did not sell. So you need to take a look at that. When you take a look at quality, they have five major attributes when we take a look at quality service. Reliability. Let's look at McDonald's. Service, taking a look at, you know, fries. How reliable is it that you're going to get the same product at each place, that when you order, you're going to get what you want? Uh, years ago, when I first moved to Tennessee, I used to pick up uh, a girl at school and take her home. It was one of my little side jobs to keep the roof over my head while I was going to school here. And we decided one day we were hungry. We wanted a snack. So we stopped at McDonald's by her school. And the fries were eh, kind of cold. They'd been sitting there for a while, really salty. So driving home, we passed to her house. We passed about six McDonald's. Luckily, we only got small fries at each one. But we stopped and we got an order of fries at each one to compare them on how reliable it was to get the product that you were supposed to get, a good, hot French fry, you know, not too salty, perfectly cooked, et cetera. Some uh, McDonald's did better than others. Um, responsiveness. If you have a problem or you request something, are they responsive to you? Are you getting what you need? Are you getting what you ask for? The tangibles. I used to work at Cracker Barrel and our uniforms had to be a certain way. And I always take a look and go wash my hands before I decide to eat at a place if I've never eaten there before. I want to see how clean their bathroom is because if their bathroom's not clean, I'm not sure I want to eat there. What's their kitchen like? Um, these are the tangibles. How clean, are, how clean is the place when you're looking at stuff? The assurance. It's talking to the people, making sure that they deliver what you need. And empathy. If something goes wrong, how do they work with you? How do they, are, are they snotty about it? Or do they show empathy and they work with you to get it fixed? I'm not saying that they're going to be able to get it fixed, but they work with you and, and they're polite about it. They're, they're understanding. What's the cost of quality? We have cost of good quality and cost of poor quality. And if you've taken business logistics, you've probably seen some of this before. But we take a look at starting in manufacturing. And when we take a look at prevention, we're preventing poor quality by making sure we have excellent uh, raw materials, that we have an excellent process that we'll be doing to make sure that we have and complete what we need. This is part of a cost of good quality, making sure we have those raw materials in the process. That's step one. Step two is appraisal when looking at good quality, as we are producing, we do quality checks. We're appraising as we go. 
This right here is another cost of good quality. The next is internal failure. This is a completed product, but we catch it. We understand that this product is not up to our quality level that we want, and we're gonna make sure it does not get to a customer. This is more costly than prevention and appraisal because we've completed the work. In prevention, we haven't even started. It's before we even start producing. We're getting our raw materials and we're taking a look at our process. Appraisal is we can rework items or scrap items as need be, but they're not completed. It's just partial completion of our product. Internal failure, that product has been completed. And if we've completed the product and it's a failure, it's usually a scrap and it's more costly once all that stuff is put together. Um, external failure is where the customer finds fault with a product, that they notify us of poor quality. That is the most expensive and the worst type of failure we can have and, and the cost, the highest cost of poor quality. You never want an external failure. You want to start with prevention, do the appraisals, hopefully not have eternal failures, but if you do, fine, you catch them. If it gets to external failures, that is the, the biggest cost that you have of poor quality. When we take a look at total quality management, our alphabet soup here, TQM, total quality management, we're looking at a philosophy. And in this philosophy, everyone um, in the business supports everyone else in the business to provide satisfaction and high quality to our customers. This is what we're looking for. So we want everyone to work together to hit our quality level for our customers. Some of the characteristics, we focus on the consumer. Their wants, their needs, not us. We worked with continuous improvement. It's never good enough. We continually want to improve. We look at quality improvement. If we're at quality level A, how can we rise up to quality level B? How can we make it for the same price but have a higher quality? How can we create something better for our consumers, our customers? We want accurate evaluation. If we're not evaluating correctly and, and accurately, then all we're doing is snowing ourselves. We're lying to ourselves. And it doesn't produce good product. Um, it involves all employee. Susie Q, the CEO, Joe Schmo sweeping floors, doesn't matter. Everyone is involved in TQM, total quality management. So let's take a look at the Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award. This award is given to organizations that exhibit the following major elements in achieving quality. And while they're listed here, we're going to go on starting with leadership. Leadership recognizes all the elements necessary to create and sustain a movement for total quality. We want to establish quality improvement goals. How can we raise our quality? And we need leadership to do this. A leader's action must encourage and support the quality efforts of their employees. They have to stand behind their employee and work with the employee to do this. Leadership is necessary at all levels of your business. Management has responsibility to foster climate uh, in which employees on all levels are motivated, are motivated to participate in continuous improvement. Everybody works. Again, Susie Q, CEO, Joe Schmo, who sweeps the floor. It does not matter. Second is human resource management. Creativity, planning, change, adaption, improvements, all within a company occur through human resources. These are the people who help us select employees based on criteria for technology, knowledge, um, abilities that they can do, whether it's lifting a 50 pound bag or it is uh, working on certain equipment. Um, HR helps us hire the right people. They're also involved with training and education. We can hire 
the right person, but if we don't train them and continue their education on this, inf- on uh, what we want them to do, then they won't have continuous improvement and we won't have continuous improvement. Um, they'll become literally uh, stagnant and we don't want that. Some ways that human resources do this is use quality circles. Quality circles are voluntary teams that work together, um, usually on a subject matter or looking at problems within a uh, organization to try to improve it. I've worked on quality circles um, when I did counseling and um, I did in-home counseling and I worked with um, clientele who were HIV positive and I worked with the company that I worked with did in-home counseling with substance abusing adults with children under the age of five at risk of -of out-of-home placement, which is what I did. We worked with foster care. We worked with daycare. We worked with adoption. Um, So a variety of things. And the quality circle that I was on worked with um, HIV issues. So whether you were in daycare, adoption, foster care, or in-home counseling, um, the in-home program, trying to keep kids in the home and not being placed in foster care or up for adoption, these issues were there. Um, The kids I worked with were at risk due to the parent's substance abuse. Um, And we talked about how each part, our, each one of our departments and each section of our uh, organization could help and make things better. Um, when we came up with one idea, we took a look at something else and we continued to meet. This is an ongoing group. A problem solving team takes a look at one problem. They dissect the problem, make use decision making, that we talked about last time, and they find the best solution to solve the problem. Implement the problem, they might take a look at the evaluation of that problem, and then they're dissolved. It, it's it's no longer there once a problem is solved. Um, self-managed work teams, we are moving towards this, which means less upper management and more management within the work team. Who does what job? Who? How are we splitting up the labor? Um, you'll still be given goals to meet um, by how much to produce, what needs to be done, but you'll get to have, uh, employees will have more input on what they would like, how they would like to meet those goals. Next is information and analysis. This is actually the company's nervous system, the backbone of the company, how everything goes together. And it coordinates information for the whole company. And decisions should be based on timely, accurate information. What is it that we take a look at? What is it that we need? If we're taking a look at statistics from one part of the company and statistics are needed in another part of the company, how is that shared? This is the information and analysis and that needs to literally coordinate throughout the entire company. Next is strategic planning. Long-term decisions that affect the overall company's actions. Top management usually identifies these future opportunities, these long-term decisions, but all levels are often involved. This, excuse me, strategic plan serves as a compass for aligning and coordinating the actions towards the goals. What roadway will you take to get to those goals? You have your plans, your process, your decisions, and your actions throughout the company that are used and uh, brought together to figure out where and how the company will, will meet those goals.